thank you, members of the Kentucky Federation of Women's Clubs, uh, to, for having invited me to this first district summer workshop. When Marion called me uh, several months ago to ask if I would uh, consider uh, speaking to you, and uh, using the image free of butterflies uh, as it relates to human aspirations and opportunities, uh, I thought that would be a very interesting thing to do. We tend to talk only scientifically sometimes uh, about butterflies and moths, uh, and this would be a nice time to reflect uh, on the, the human values that are intertwined uh, with that science. So I've been very much looking forward to this, and uh, a visitor from overseas happened through. We Lepidopterists have a network, and we know one another's addresses, and when we're traveling in a different place from home, we sometimes contact one another. And many Lepidopterists have stopped by our house here at Paducah. Uh, Western Kentucky is well known uh, in the world of Lepidoptery. Uh, and my wife and I often joke that some of our guests uh, are so enthusiastic and so absorbed in the science uh, that and they, they use the scientific names in the descriptions and uh, we joke that they speak only pure Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Paul Waring is a lepidopterist who could easily do that. He has mastered his Latin and his Greek and his lepidopter. Uh, he uh, attended Oxford University as an undergraduate, got his master's there, has gone on to get his PhD uh, at the university in Oxford. He met his wife, uh, who was also a PhD candidate there in Oxford, and uh, she is a forester, uh, and they have one delightful little four-year-old girl whose picture I saw riding in the backpack that looked identical to the ones that my children rode in uh, on my back. Paul Waring is an absolute delight, and I thought if I could convince Merriman to let him speak instead of me, you would certainly enjoy it. And uh, he is interested in our culture. He's had his camera out at every turn. He has recorded people's thoughts on every subject that is important to us. Uh, and he has spotted some subjects uh, that are important to him that we haven't even recognized here among ourselves. Uh, we have keep him, kept him up till three in the morning, catching moths at night, <laughs> and I make him get up at seven. And uh, he would have cause to feel weary here at this moment, but he was enthused about coming here and talking to you too. Uh, you're gonna love this guy, Paul Ware. Uh, you, you're not going to have that trouble with me. Uh, I, I have the voice of a Southern Democrat. <laughs> However, I don't appear to have my notes. Um, they've, they've been moved. You've picked them up. This is my guy. He's introduced me. He's also my gracious host. He's a man who I have so many things to be grateful for in enjoying Kentucky, its people, and its wildlife. But he's taken, he took my notes just to try and throw me. Now, I came here uh, to, to visit Bill and to see some wonderful moths, which you have. And in normal ways, I would probably uh, show photographs of moths, and we would talk about moths in their habitat, and we would talk about perhaps the relevance of moths to man. And that's not just the moths that eat your carpets. We would talk about moths as indicators of climate change, perhaps. In England, we have moths which are moving further north. They've always been associated with the south, but they're moving north because our climate is getting warmer and allowing them to do so. And our climate is changing in other subtle ways which the moths actually identify and demonstrate to us. Our moth fauna in Britain shows us the ways in which we have changed the habitat, the environment in which we live. 
through farming, particularly intensive farming methods, which are not only a cause for concern to people who are worried about chemicals getting into their diet, but are also a cause for concern because of their impact on wildlife, the animals and plants with which we share this planet. I talk about moths in many other instances. We talk about the taxonomy of moths, the way moths are named and whether we've got the right names and the right relationships between moths. We sometimes talk about how many hairs there are on the back leg of a moth and whether this is useful in telling one moth from another, one species from another and so on. But I'm not going to talk about any of those things. I've mentioned them. Some of you may feel familiar with some of those, but I'm going to go on and talk about a completely different thing. I'm going to talk about the value of making and taking opportunities. And I'm going to draw a comparison with the moths that I study, the metamorphosis, the transformation between the different stages of a moth's life cycle. Now, I know some of you have done biology at school, at high school, and you will know that moths lay eggs, and from those eggs come caterpillars. And many of those caterpillars feed our songbirds and our other animals. I was out the other day and there was a raccoon following me. He was interested in eating the moths too, and more particularly the baits, which we apply to trees. We paint trees with a mixture of molasses and some secret ingredients. This could be a recipe for moonshine, but it's not. <laughs> it's a way of trapping moths, and in particular some moths, which I will show you a bit more closely later on, but these are some of Kentucky's moths. Now these particular moths are moths that I came all the way here to see because we do not have so many of these moths in Britain. And I've read about this particular group. They all look like the bark of trees because they are hiding against the bark of trees during the daytime. And they do not want to be eaten by birds. So if they look like the tree trunk, the bird may not see them. Should the bird see them, and disturb them, they flash orange or red hind wings, which startles the bird, gives the moth a chance to get away. In Britain, where I grew up, we have one or two species like this. Here in North America, you have 110 species. And in Kentucky alone, 60 of them have been recorded, and some are being discovered, which we didn't know were here. There is a historical aspect to my visit, because not only am I interested in these moths, but a guy from England, from the same county as the college from which, to which I am now attached in Essex, called Riddle College, an agricultural college, he came here to Kentucky in 1832. And you were still fighting North Americans in 1832. And he's studied moths. We know that he collected moths in Louisville and various other places. He was also the inventor of the technique that I just described of painting molasses on trees. And I am following in his footsteps in many ways. The types of moths that come particularly to those molasses mixtures are these very types. Now, that's all very well. I have a, clearly a keen interest in moths. But I have been able to take the study of moths beyond being a boyhood hobby to actually a profession. And I have worked for 25 years earning a living doing the thing I love most. That is a great opportunity, one for which I am most grateful. It's not an opportunity that was offered on a plate. And at the time that I started my studies, there was nobody studying moths in this way full time in Britain and earning a living at it. So in many ways, I was lucky, but you could say that I created an opportunity. Now, I would like to talk a little bit about how all of that happened and the ways in which I have been able to benefit. Now, I would like to think that others have benefited from the research that's been done and also from our activities generally, but I have been able to, uh, to do this um, in a particular way. And the lady that you may have observed sitting next to me put it delightfully. Mrs. Hocker 
sitting next to me as we were having lunch, and she said, now tell me, how did you and moths become acquainted? And I just love that. I just love that southern turn of phrase. Um, so I'm going to tell you. Now, recently, I'd, I'd, always, I'd always been interested in moths as far as I knew. I had uh, uh, pictures of moths that I drew when I was at school and pictures of other insects. And I was interested in birds and, and mammals and so on and so forth as well. But recently, um, shortly after my father died last, um, well, a little while ago, um, it's taken me a long time to sort through his many papers because this man kept virtually every bill and receipt that he seemed ever to have had. And I had to sort through them. But he kept them in boxes, a bit like this one. Um, and he didn't order them too well. And I would be going through these boxes and I would find bills of long forgotten items that nobody could possibly find of any use. And then, in between them, I would find his marriage certificate. <laughs> and many other things that shed light on, on my own history. But one thing I found which staggered me and surprised me, and I'm so grateful for, is a letter that my mum wrote to my dad when he was searching for work in another town. And he was going there at weekends to find a house for us to live in. And she was at home with her, her parents, my grandparents, in the New Forest. The New Forest is in the deep south of England. Four miles further south and you would be in the sea. It is in Hampshire. The New Forest is an area a bit like parts of Kentucky, so you can envisage it in this way. It has large trees growing in quite large areas of forest with some open ground in between, some of which is farm, but most of which is in fact open countryside. It's very good habitat for moths. There are many wildflowers there, many food plants for the caterpillars. Why is it that way? It's quite unique in England because since 1086, that's over a th nearly a thousand years ago, it has been a royal forest. Initially when William the Conqueror came to England he declared it a royal hunting preserve where the animals had a priority and an importance. And for a lot of historical reasons, it has continued to be maintained as a forest where the wildlife is of prime importance. And I was fortunate enough to grow up in that area. Now, my mother wrote to my father this letter in which she said, among many other things, because it's a general letter, she said, Paul is now playing with a moth. He is studying a green, furry caterpillar which has black stripes and red tufts. The fact that she put those details into that letter shows, it gives an indication of the sort of mum that she was. She was clearly interested because most people would perhaps have said in that village, uh, that if they mentioned it at all, Paul has a caterpillar on the table. But she said those few words, which enabled me, when I found that paper, to know instantly that that was the caterpillar of the pale tussock moth. The next thing that she had done was she had written the date and the, the letter, because my father, who kept all these things, had kept it in the original envelope with the stamp, with a postmark, which is dated August, no, Ju no, it wasn't, it was dated June 1960. Now, you can look at me, and you might even think that, well, June 1960, um, June 1960, I was two years and nine months old. And that constitutes my first evidence of my interest. Maybe I had the interest earlier, but it's very fortunate to know that I had that interest since I was two and three quarters. And it also constitutes my first biological record. Because from her description, that caterpillar could be no other species than that one. And she says where I found it. It's from the house where my grandparents lived. I can go back there, and I have done so many times. And I used to have all my school holidays there. And I know the food plants that occur there and so on, and I can give it a grid reference. And 
over the winter, I took the trouble to send that information to the county moth recorder, who sent it on to our national moth recording scheme, so that it can take its place with all this other data to look at climate change, the distributions of moths, the way in which we've changed our habit, and all those other things I introduced this talk with. And that gave me a great deal of pleasure, because Bill, Bill certainly, as a, a fellow moth enthusiast, knows the value of transmitting that information on. That information becomes more important as time goes on, because it is a baseline against which we can calibrate and measure the changes that take place now and in the future. So there are uses to the sorts of things that Bill and I do, which affect everybody. It's also very enjoyable. It's a social occasion. I continued this boyhood interest, and my parents were understanding about this interest. They didn't say, oh, crazy. They developed it. My mum was a school teacher, and she saw interests, and as they developed, she would almost by magic, find books that I could read to take that interest further. And in our church, uh, there was a man who was also interested in moths. Surprisingly, perhaps, you might think. But there are thousands of people interested in moths in, in Britain. I'm fortunate to have had the opportunity in later years of writing a book on moths to enable everyone from absolute beginners to identify our British moths. It's a comprehensive guide written in plain English to reach everybody, because we don't want to put you off with a smokescreen of scientific names, and Latin language, and so on. This book was published in August last year and has sold 10,000 copies, which for a moth book is <laughs> quite going some. It also is an indication of how relevant moths are to 10,000 people that they would part with their hard-earned money, this is £30 for the softback, £45 for the hardback. And I have a trunk of them out in the car, and you're very welcome to buy them up. <laughs> for those of you that aren't familiar with the dollar exchange rate at the moment, you can multiply those figures by about one and a half to see that this is quite an outlay, and 10,000 people have decided that that's how they choose to spend their money. So there's a, a big interest. Now, a lot of people wouldn't be sufficient interest to to, to buy this book. But I'm looking around and I see butterfly insignias on dresses and shirts and tablecloths and so on. And this demonstrates that the butterflies and moths, which all belong to the order Lepidoptera in science, that they have a relevance to people. Otherwise, the manufacturers of the cloth wouldn't, wouldn't put the in insignias on. So that's yet another demonstration of a relevance and a cultural side to moths and butterflies. Now, I've already indicated that Edward Doubleday, this guy from Essex, was here in 1832. We're fortunate in Britain that we have a history of moth recording going back about 300 years. And you might be surprised to hear that moth traps, and Bill and I run moth traps, with lights and candles and so on like this were the predecessor to lights, Moth traps were designed before AD 60. Little lobster pot type tin structures with candles much like those that are lighting your table now were placed by the ancients in beehives to attract the wax moth, which is a predator that causes damage to bees and the production of honey. So everything goes around, comes around, and we have been trapping moths probably since the first cavemen built fires and noticed that the flames were attracting moths in. We also have a great culture in Britain about moths. The names of the moths themselves reveal things about our past. We have a group of moths that stand upright and rather smart looking, and they are dignified by the name footman moths. And you will re relate to that. You will remember how in the south here you had footmen who would go to the door and let people through. You probably call them something completely different because we are two nations separated by a common language. And it's often the case that you use different terms for the same thing. But anyway, we have moths that are called wainscot moths. Would you know what wainscots are? 
There's some nodding going on. Yeah, I bet you have them here, probably in some of those old mansions. They're the pale timber that runs around the floor, between the wall and the floor, the skirting board. There is a sort of dark skirting board effect here. Today, my wife would say, well, that's, uh, that's to prevent damage to the walls caused by the hoover. <laughs> but they've been around for a lot longer than that. And they were usually made of a pale wood at one time. And the moths have wings which look just like that pale wood with grain in. But why? Because they blend in with reeds and other uh, dying plant material. And again, they can't be seen by the birds. And they mimic the very veins that are produced, are produced in reed stems and reed leaves and in timber as well as it grows. Okay. This is all very well, uh, a great deal of interest. I actually was able to take the interest further, um, ultimately to a degree in zoology at Oxford University, because I was encouraged by my parents and they provided opportunities and I took them. That then led on to a career, which has lasted for 25 years now, 12 of those freelance, working initially for the government conservation agencies, and then subsequently as a freelance mainly to them but also to other organizations including voluntary organizations like yourselves who are interested in protecting our habitats. They sometimes help to buy them and obtain government grants to help create preserves for wildlife. Now mainly they're interested in walking through nice places and sitting under the shade of trees and they don't want everything to become tarmac and built up. Um, they want safe places for children to play and where they can see the wonders of nature too. But in amongst all that, they're doing great guns for moth conservation. And we obtain permission to go to these places. And we see some beautiful moths. Now, most of you have probably only seen a few moths, maybe the ones that come to light when you're reading in bed and there's one bashing away at the window. If you're interested afterwards, I can tell you about why they come to light, but it's nothing to do with the moon and navigation. It's confusion. They're being dazzled. And they, they come to light. And because of this, we can design sampling methods to find them. And when we do, we can see moths like this one on the front and these colorful ones on the back here. And this one, which was brought in by one of you ladies, from her garage, or garage. <laughs> and this is the American moon moth. This does not occur in any other part of the country, uh, part of the world. Um, it's the American moon moth. We have one in the old world as well, the Indian moon moth. You have to go to India and Asia to see it. It's a beautiful moth. We've seen many of these, and it's a great thrill. Uh, we sit and talk about all manner of things when we're waiting for the moths to come in and suddenly out from the treetops comes this great moth flying in and then another one and you never know what is going to come next and every morning when we go out to the traps we open them up and it's like Christmas every day seeing what you got. So moths really affect us in many ways and I've been very fortunate. Now to start to round out this talk Moths created the opportunity for me to come to Kentucky and to meet you all. They came, created the opportunity for me to stay with fellow lepidopterists like Bill and uh, the Segabarth family who live here in Paducah. And a most gracious man, Richard Henderson. Mr. Henderson spent three days with me. He offered to come to the airport in Louisville to collect me. What he didn't then tell me is that we were going straight in convoy up into the hills, up to the Otter Creek Park. And I thought, well, great, yeah, let's use the first night before it gets dark to get our traps out and so on. Um, he didn't, however, tell me that we were going to stay there for three days, um, <laughs> away from all the things that you may take for granted, like telephones, because a cell phone wouldn't work out there. I hadn't even emailed or phoned my wife to let her know I'd arrived safely. I hadn't bought any food. No water even, you know, breaking all the rules of the mountain men. Uh, the golden rule of field work is never get separated from your lunch. <laughs> anyway, Richard had provided all these things. Richard has a camper van. Now, Richard is an African-American. And we had three days in which we found we shared a lot of things other 
than our interest in moths. We talked about moth traps and their design and how we could improve each other's design and so on. But we also had three days to enjoy each other's company. We got on like a house on fire. And we were able to talk about a lot of other things as well. He gave me a, another insight into America that I perhaps wouldn't have gotten from meeting up with a lot of other moth people. He gave me insights into the history of your country from a different perspective to that which many of you would here have. And he also told me about the cultural significance of the Lepidoptera to his people going back a number of generations. And what I would like to say about the study of butterflies and moths is that everyone is welcome to take it up and you will meet people from all levels of society. My family were basically pig farmers two generations back in the New Forest. And then one generation back, we were into working with leather when horses were important and so on. And then the generation that produced me, well, there were job opportunities elsewhere and we moved away. And I feel like sometimes I'm living in exile and I go back to this place as often as I can and at least once a year to see the trees and so on. It gave me the opportunity to meet a Rear Admiral Torless, a very big man in the British Navy. And again, when I was out with him, sugaring for moths, as we call this technique, we talked about many things and many parts of the world to which he had traveled when I was a boy of 17. And he inspired me to go out and see how people live in other places, and, which I did. And uh, I've been to most ca um, continents now except for Australia. That's a valuable thing here in itself. Many Americans that I've met don't seem to have actually got outside the States. And 9-11, I think, really, you know, pulled people up in some ways. About, do they really view us like that elsewhere? Now, I'm not a politician. I ain't going to get into any, any more of that. But I'm saying that moths created opportunities for me to learn a lot more than just moths. And I've benefited so much by my time here. I'd like to thank you all, as citizens of Kentucky, for maintaining a place that is nice for people like me to come and visit with wildlife. But I hope you will do more, because they tell me that many trees, big old trees that were here in Edward Doubleday's time, for example, in the 1830s and 40s, because many trees around here are well over 200 years old. Many of those trees are being felled needlessly by people who often don't think about how long that tree took to grow. It has a, another significance apart from defining the character of your area and maintaining that link with previous generations. And that is that the moths that I came all this way across the Atlantic to see can only feed on the leaves of certain species as caterpillars. Many of the ones in this box will only feed on your oaks and others in the box will only feed on your hickories. If you cut down the big old trees, they don't, uh, the caterpillars hide, which hide in the grooves in the bark will not be able to feed on hickories and oaks that are growing this high. They may have leaves, but they don't have all the protection and the other opportunities that a big tree affords. Furthermore, they can starve if there are no hickories and oaks. If you take a big old tree and you say, oh, I'll replace it with another tree. That tree, I'll choose to be a fast growing one so that we'll have shade in maybe just 10 or 20 years. I might even choose a conifer tree because they're evergreen all year round. That'll look nice in the garden or the backyard, as you say, <laughs> which to us means a tarmac surface on which you would park your car, not the often palatial grounds that you are fortunate enough to enjoy here compared with uh, people who live in our inner cities who maybe have a window box for growing plants like this. You know. Anyway, on your, in your yard, you have these, these, these wonderful old trees. And without those trees, you will lose these moths and you will lose a part of our shared heritage. Finally, I'd like to make it easy for you to remember the theme or themes that I've developed on this talk. There is a passage in the Bible that says, of lilies, in fact, that King Solomon, in all his splendor, was not arrayed like one of these. I like to think that, yeah, the Bible dealt with lilies, but 
that they would say the same things about the moths in this box. I would like a shirt with stripes on it like that. I would like to have a car with seat covers of this design. So any of you people here that might be involved in the textile industry, <laughs> market opportunity, and America's good at that, isn't it? Okay, I would just like to leave you with the thought that this moth in this box here was a caterpillar with a top speed of a few inches an hour. It fed and it grew. It looked much like a worm. It wasn't really a very significant thing. And if it was lucky, it avoided being eaten by a bird. But when it grew up, it produced chrysalis, buried in the ground. It then emerged at the right time of the year when the rains and the temperature told it that, that was the right time to emerge. And let's say it was a female. We've got a room here that's almost entirely full of females. This female moth emerged, she pumped her wings up, and she was probably involved in a rendezvous with a male very shortly. And they did what we all do to produce the next generation, and it flew off and laid eggs. Now this little moth has all the sophistication of a jump jet fighter. It has the wings delta-shaped. This moth can do vertical takeoff. It can fly at speed, it can turn. If it hears a bat, it can drop like a stone, it can evade that bat. This moth can fly backwards. It can hover at a flower like this and maintain an absolute stationary position while it feeds with long tongue. This moth and its ancestors have been doing this for millions of years. This moth has achieved, it's survived, it's still here. Through all the changes in civilization, going back, way back beyond mankind to the time of the dinosaurs, this moth was here. It's a success story. Would you have thought that that lowly caterpillar could have produced something as technologically advanced as this. No, you wouldn't, but it could. I'd like to leave you that simile, that we can achieve things almost unimaginable, but we got to make and take opportunities. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. There'll be a few minutes la later for some discussions um, and questions, uh, just a few minutes. I'd like to thank you for your gracious company and for inviting us. You got me as a sort of byproduct of Bill, let's be honest. Um, but I hope that I've justified your time and I'd like to thank you again for giving us this opportunity to spread the word about moths and many other things. So the next time you see a moth, please don't step on it or... That's, that lady over there said, that's just what I was thinking. Please don't step on it. Please take that moth outside. Don't worry, these moths will not harm you in any way. I know that some men and women are frightened of moths, but they will not harm you or bite you or sting you. So please find a jar or a cup and a bit of paper. You don't have to handle the moth and let it go so that it can continue for many more generations to spread its kind throughout the world and inspire people. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Uh, in this area around the bath, I'm not familiar with more than three or four types. The polyphema and the uh, Cecropia and the Luna and what we call the tobacco fly. Now, what? And outside of those, I don't remember seeing any except they be no. The, no. Right. The question from the lady over here is about some of the uh, moths in her area, and she has only had the opportunity to see a few types. And she's asking, you know, uh, or, or implying, are there only relatively few in her area? She's described some of the biggest and finest of the moths that occur here, like the emperor moths, the silk moths, and one which ha is uh, known as a horn tail. Um, the uh, tobacco hornworm moth. Um, now, 
there are there are many types I'm sure that Bill and I could find if uh, you would extend an invitation to Bill to come to your backyard and set up one of his traps he is continually looking for opportunities like this and the very fine Kentucky Lepidopteris would delight in coming to see you and sharing with you the results of their moth trapping so please could you come up to Bill after we are informal and give him your address so he can arrange for somebody to come round you would find them most interesting uh, uh, as uh, moth collectors and they would show you I guarantee you um, on one visit probably several dozen species and if you would be so gracious to accept him each month of the year <laughs> on one day he would work through the year and he might come up with a list of moths for your garden of maybe some several hundred species but you've put your finger on a very valid point and that is that unless you have some of these techniques you may not see that many moths and that's why so many people have a relatively I'm not going to say lowly, I'm going to say undeveloped as, uh, attitude to moths. And that's something that Bill and all the other people in the Lepidopteris Society would like to share with you. So you give them an opportunity, they will take it. I happen to know who your favorite singer is, but I'm going to ask you, American singer, if you would tell, share that with the one of you. Well, uh, Ladies, you, you, you might just have noticed that I'm not wearing a shirt with uh, butterfly and moth insignias. I'm actually wearing a, a shirt here, which, uh, can you see that? <laughs> there, there are black and white saxophone players and guitarists and piano players on this shirt. Uh, the, this shirt is worn in homage to the great rhythm and blues artists. Who, and there is rhythm and blues, see there, written up there. The great rhythm and blues artists that your country has produced that have inspired people like me all over the world. And, you know, this is a, another culture which I came here to study. Now, I take opportunities, right? It hasn't escaped my notice that it is 50 years since Elvis recorded his first record in Memphis, Tennessee. That was in July 1954. And 50 years on, we are celebrating this event in Memphis. It's also uh, a number of years since Elvis died. Uh, he, he is believed to be dead. <laughs> and on the 16th of August 1977, Elvis officially left the building for the last time. And in celebration of that every year there is a festival in in memphis to celebrate the achievements of that great man and that man probably more than any other in terms of the people who enjoyed a worldwide profile he brought so many aspects of your shared american culture to us all over the world he's a great ambassador to us um, he's a great animal lover actually you may know that Graceland at one time was uh, hotching, as we say, with geese and dogs and cats and even a chimpanzee, I believe. And I'm going to take an opportunity to combine this trip with a visit to Memphis, Tennessee that I've read about. I want to walk down Beale Street and go into B.B. King's Club. Now I know, and there's some people in this audience I can see over there, that may know that uh, Beale Street has been like redeveloped and you Americans uh, have a singular way of redeveloping. Um, 20 years ago you thought so little of Beale Street that you decided you're going to knock it down. And I know people who came here uh, in the 1980s uh, who saw old buildings like, uh, would I be right in saying the Daisy Theatre, um, knock down um, the I'm trying to think now of places that I've read about. Um, I mean, Sun Studios, where Elvis recorded, was a, a radiator shop. And for many years, it was just a forgotten place. Because the culture, let's say, it wasn't re not, not recognized, but it was not valued particularly. And then I think as much for pressure from outside, and people, crazy people like me who come to see these things, people sort of thought, hang on there, 
maybe, maybe we should take a bit more notice of our old buildings. Um, I know I'm speaking now on another subject that is dear to Bill Black's heart, and those in the, in the audience will know this. Um, would I be able to have a couple more minutes to just tell a tale? Would, I, would that be allowable? I, I wanted to, I know this isn't about moss, but I wanted to share with you a tale. Uh, a feature of Paducah is the railway, railroad, sorry. And uh, we, we, were, uh, we were waiting for a freight train. And the wagons of this train seemed to go on for miles and miles as we sat at what I call a level crossing, and I expect you have a different word for it. And we sat there, and, and then one of my host said, well, hang on a minute, let's go over the bridge. So we went over the bridge as an alternative way of crossing the railroad tracks. And uh, we looked down into what I would call the sidings or yard, where these trains of wagons were moving around. And of course, I, I, I'm going to present the results of my trip to the British Entomological Society when I get back. There's going to be photographs, an evening meeting, an article in the British Journal of Entomology. But I'm going to open up this talk with the, the significance of Paducah. And one of the most important things uh, about why Paducah is here uh, is the, the confluence of the rivers and the transportation system that that enabled. And then the railroad and its developments, and you, I understand, made a lot of the locomotives that run on those railroads. And I wanted to get that summarized in a couple of photographs to just introduce that topic before moving on. Give some of the guys in the UK a feel for where I've been. And so I jump out of the pickup, Bill has kind of pulled over, and he goes off to turn around, and I take a couple of photographs, and just as I'm going back to the pickup, another pickup pulls up behind, and I think, oh my goodness, I'm going to start causing a traffic jam here. Better get in and get on. But no, a great big burly guy gets out of this pickup, and he has what looks like an oversized tin star from a, a sheriff's uniform. Um, <laughs> the thing that I used to enjoy in The Lone Ranger, which, yeah, we had that, you know, like we were watching reruns of that about 20 years after it was shot, you know, that was the way it was. That's what we thought you Americans lived like for a while. There was another character that I should uh, mention who taught me more about the South than I realized at the time. If I say the words, Holy there, deputy dog! <laughs> I think that might strike a chord. So we, we picked up a lot, a lot of Southern culture. We, we uh, explored that, and that sort of got, got me even before the rock and roll thing. And, and, uh, and I'm coming here to eat grits and black eyed peas as much as see the moths. And, and I've been able to do that. I've been able to find out from Ri Mr. Richard Henderson what grits actually are. Because you can't, you can't even buy the ingredients in, uh, in, in Britain as far as I'm aware. Anyway, the important thing is about that little tale that that sort of tin star thing which is actually made out of cast iron and would really hurt if you threw it at somebody is actually some kind of a brace for strengthening walls of old buildings so that we can continue to enjoy them and preserve them for future generations. And Mr. Bill Black, in his wisdom, has been collecting things like this so that when he is called in, as his line is in this type of work, he can get it right and he can restore to a certain level. And I got onto all of that by talking about Beale Street because I know that B.B. King's club is partly set up for tourists but I know that it's reflecting a, a culture that is becoming increasingly important and people are becoming increasingly aware of it. And I just wanted you to know that we are aware of a lot of what you do over in the, st in the UK now. We have website access. <laughs> so we can fo I have had a virtual tour of the hotel that I'm going to be staying at in Memphis without leaving my upstairs bedroom. We are increasingly aware of what everybody else in the world does. We, can, we should follow that with an increasing understanding of how to live with and get on with those people. And I hope that in this small way, um, we have been able to draw your attention to some things which will help you to do that. So again, thanks very much indeed for sharing with me that, that last little tale. I'm the sort of guy that could talk all day, but I mustn't. <laughs>